Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining um, this event. I would like to welcome you all. I especially thank, thank our speakers that have been here um, waiting for um, participants to join. Um, we'll commence you know, the event now and you know, hopefully more participants join as we go on. Um, my name is Adeb Sisonda. I'm the chair uh, for CCLS alumni in Nigeria. Um, I welcome you to today's event. Um, the CCLS, as you know, is the Center for Commercial Law Studies, which is the postgraduate school, um, law school for Premier University of London. Um, we set up the alumni association with the um, intention to, you know, organize events like this to share ideas, to network, and to to network and to um, essentially to continue some of the conversations we started, you know, while we we're at school. So, you know, hopefully, as time goes on, we'll have more intellectual and more um you know legal or law related matters and we'll be able to drive the development of law in nigeria um i just want to read out some things about ccls the ccls was set up to create an environment where commercial lawyers and academics could exchange ideas the intention behind this is that understanding is that understanding that when you bring together different perspectives you are likely to achieve better outcomes. Today, the CCLS has taught over 10,000 students from different countries around the world. I personally think that the discussion we would have here today is very important, and I hope um, everyone takes away uh, one or two things from these discussions. I will especially again like to thank um, the speakers, the Honorable Commissioner for Justice, um, Delta States. Um, Dr. Adesonya, thank you very much. I also thank um, Inameka is an um, associate at the international law firm Bechart. Um, Idanesi may be joining us soon. I've not been able to uh, place hold of her, but she mentioned that she was having some scheduling issues earlier on. I will now hand over the um, event to Kuseme and Oladotu who are present LLM candidates at Queen Mary University of London. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Adebisi. And hello, everyone. Welcome to this session. And thank you for making it right here on time. Um, I'll be moderating this session with my colleague, Dotson. Uh, my name is Kuseme Ise. Um, I just graduated well. My graduation is in January, but I have finished my coursework. So I really do consider myself as a current student anymore. So I just finished from CCLS. Um, I studied comparative and international dispute resolution. And yeah, I'll be moderating this session with Dotson and allow Dotson to speak now. Thank you very much, Kusume. Um, good morning, everyone. Or oh, should I say afternoon? My name is Ola Dotson Bolagunte. Um, I also recently completed my LLM program at Creamery University of London at the Center for Commercial and Commercial Law Studies. Um, I, I took commercial and corporate law um, during my time at Queen Mary. I also haven't graduated, but um, I have completed my coursework. I currently work as a, an associate legal counsel in an investment company, Celex. I'm happy to be here. And I will be moderating this session with Kusema as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Dr. So what is going to be happening? It will be like a question and answer session and our panelists, our prestigious panelists will be answering these questions for us. Um, I'm going to, we are going to be reading out the profiles of the panelists shortly before the questions. And during, uh, when you were filling the form, there was, a space for questions. So when we start the session, we're going to first take those questions before we take the questions that you'll be sending in the chat box. So um, welcome everyone once again. I will just go ahead and read from the profile. 
Okay, um, let's start with that of Mr. Isaiah Bozimo. Mr. Isaiah Bozimo attended the University of Central Lancashire for his undergraduate law degree and graduated in 2003. He thereafter proceeded to the London School of Economics and Politics, LSE, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and finished with a master's in law degree in 2005. He also attended the Nigerian Law School in 2006 and the prestigious Queen Mary University of London and graduated in 2013 with an LLM in comparative and international dispute resolution. That is my course, and I feel so privileged to be, you know, on the same meeting with the current attorney general who also did my course. He is a partner at Broderick, Broderick Bozimo and Company, a practice specializing in arbitration and dispute resolution. His reputation for delivering high value settlements and victories earned him a recognition by who's who legal as a future leader in arbitration. He has represented state-owned entities, corporations, and high net worth individuals in several ad hoc and institutional arbitrations, and has also served as a sole arbitrator and co-arbitrator under the rules of International Chamber of Commerce, ICC, the Lagos Court of Arbitration, LCA, the Lagos State Multidoco House, LMDC, and the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, UNTUJO. He previously chaired the advisory board of the Lagos Court of Arbitration Young Arbitrators Forum and served as a representative of the ICC Young Arbitrators Forum for Africa, the Middle East, and Turkey. In that regard, he provided strategic guidance and mentorship through free workshops for young African legal practitioners and students in Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, and Rwanda. His leadership abilities earned him an appointment on the drafting committee for Nigeria's arbitration and mediation bill. He has contributed to international publications, books, and guides in the field of international commercial arbitration, such as Rethinking the Role of African National Courts in Arbitration, 2018 Walters Kluwer, The Delors Guide to Arbitration Places, and the New York Convention Guide. He is the current Attorney General and Commissioner for Justice Delta State, Nigeria. Welcome to the session, Mr. Isaiah. So good to have you here. I'll hand over to Dr. to read the next profile, please. Thank you very much, Kuseme. I will be reading the profile of Dr. Sherif Abiodun Adesoya. Dr. Sherif Abiodun Adesoya is a bright and tenacious lawyer, PhD holder, and telecommunications law expert with highly innovative ideas. He attended the prestigious Bradfield College, Berkshire, England, where he completed his A-levels before gaining admission to the University of Exeter, where he graduated with a second class upper in 2009, after which he went on to the Nigerian Law School and passed his, and passed bar, his bar finals in 2010. He is also a master of laws in commercial and corporate law. He, he also has a, commercial, a master of laws in commercial and corporate law, that is my course, from Queen Mary, University of London awarded in 2011 and subsequently completed his PhD in telecommunications law and regulation at the University of Leicester in 2020. His doctoral thesis was titled Good Regulation and Convergence in the Nigerian Telecommunications Sector. He is a seasoned litigator, having successfully argued matters both at the trial and appellate courts. He has also been involved in the recovery of billions of naira for various clients in Nigeria including but not limited to Sterling Bank PLC, Unity Bank PLC, Wema Bank PLC, to name but a few. He is also a regular face at the National Industrial Court, where he has appeared and argued for both employees and employers on countless occasions. He also took part in the subsequent out-of-court settlement resulting from the landmark Supreme Court decision in the case of Lunge versus Federal Bank of Nigeria PLC. That is amazing. He has also represented and advised various telecommunications industry players, including the NCC and Global Com Limited, amongst many others. Dr. Adesoya is an active member of the Nigerian Bar Association, Lagos Branch, a member of the International Bar Association, and a member of Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Sheriff Abiodun Adesoya. You're welcome very much. Thank you. Very interesting profile, I must say. <laughs> So I'll go ahead to read that of um, Idanesi Emmanuel. 
Danasi Emmanuel did her undergraduate law degree from the BPP Law School, where she graduated with a first class in 2013. She then proceeded to the Center for Commercial Law Studies, CCLS, Queen Mary University of London, and completed an LLM in Corporate and Commercial Law in 2014. She has a level three award certificate in RICS and Financial Services, level six diploma in Investment Compliance and Regulations and Compliance from the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investments, the CISI. She worked as a Business Development Director at BPP FCD in London, Legal Assistant in Fisher Meredith, Debt Advisor in Southwest London Law Center, and a Business Development Director in Generation Success, CIC. She is currently a Compliance Officer at Morgan Stanley in London, United Kingdom. So pleased to have Idana C today on today's panel. So that's when we read the last one, last but not the least, of course. So it's firstly, I must say it's amazing to see that there are so many um, commercial and corporate law um, persons here. I think that's just amazing. So I'm going to read um, Naimeka is his profile. Naimeka is an associate in the London office of Dechet LLP. Prior to joining Dechet, Naimeka attended Federal Government College Warri, Delta State, and studied law at the University of Lagos. He was called to the Nigerian Bar in 2012. He was a lawyer at Simon Cooper's partners, Lagos, where he worked with the vice president, Professor, Professor Yemi Oshibajo. Nnaemeka obtained his LLM in commercial and corporate law at Kumari University of London in 2014. He was also an, he was an associate at Babalaki and Co LLP Lagos in 2015 before returning to London as a trainee solicitor at Freshfield Brockhurst Deringa LLP in 2016. In 2017, he became a solicitor of England and Wales and qualified as a corporate finance associate at Freshfield in 2018. He has undertaken secondment to Heathrow Airport Limited and Euro Money International Investor PLC. Mm -hmm. Let's change it. What does it? Oh, thank you. He joined Dechet LLP in 2021, where he focuses his practice on corporate finance matters with an emphasis on complex real estate backed finance transactions, representing a broad range of clients across the capital structure and credit spectrum. Naimeka is an avid supporter of Manchester United FC. Thank you very much, um, Naimeka, for joining us today. Um, I'm aware that Mayu is playing about 20 minutes. So thank you for taking our time to be with us today. It must be a lot of sacrifice, right? <laughs> it is, it really is. But it's not a sacrifice at all, actually. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Yeah. He's not yeah. the only Man United fan here as well. We're many. We're many. <laughs> Good to see that. Wow, interesting profile. And, you know, I was almost overwhelmed with the whole corporate commercial law LLM, but I'm so proud because at least there's someone who studied comprehensive and international dispute resolution here. And um, I also share some stuff with Naimeka because I also worked at the Babalaki Manco. So, hey, yeah. <laughs> We'll go ahead to take the questions, but I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that um, our panelists can put on their videos and connect, possibly connect with the audience. Okay, now I can see everybody's faces. Glad to meet everyone. Dotu, um, maybe before we go ahead to take the questions, would you like our panelists to say one or two things before we just throw the questions at them? What do you think? Yeah, I think that would be amazing. Particularly, I think we should give um, the Honorable Attorney General of um, Delta State an opportunity to speak to us prior to go ahead, going ahead with questions. So, Mr. Isaiah, please, the floor is yours, sir. Uh, Doctor, thank you very much. Thank you also, Kuseme. It's um, an absolute pleasure to be part of this panel. Um, it was really amazing reading or, or looking at some of the, the profiles uh, to see what uh, CCLS has produced over the years. Um, I'm looking forward to the questions. I'm sure you have very many, particularly those of you who are considering doing a master's degree. So yeah, just a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Delighted to be sharing a panel with everyone. Uh, Nimika had me until he said he was a, a fan of Manchester United, but you know, we'll forgive him for that. So uh, I'm looking forward to the discussions and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I, I, th I think it's just proper to go around. So we'll go next with Dr. Ade Soya. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, likewise, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, 
I mean, I'm open to giving, well, some insights as to what the LLM entails and the experience we've gone through. So really and truly, um, it's a pleasure to be here. That's more or less all I have to say. Thank you very much, Dr. Adesoya. Can we have um, Idanesi Emmanuel, please? Hello, everyone. It's, uh, I, I'm just so happy to be on this panel and see how many people, um, I, Emeka and I were on the same cohort as, as well as uh, at UBC. So it's, it's just wonderful to see how far we've come uh, since uh, our days in, in Holborn, <laughs> CPLS. Um, I'm looking forward to the panel and I hope, I hope we can help uh, allay any uh, fears or you know, answer any questions that you know, people have. So thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Nameka, is it? It's fine, just call me Nameka. Um, oh, fantastic. Thank you very much for, I'm glad to be um, on the panel. Um, to the Attorney General, I hope that we can have a drink and talk about, you know, our differences because my United is still the best team in the world. But other than that, I look forward to an engaging panel. Thank you very much. Kuzema, back to you. Thank you very much, um, everyone. Welcome again. And um, I think I just want to say thank you to the CCLS Nigerian chapter, especially Mr. Adebisi for putting this together. And um, I'll just go ahead and take the questions. The first question, would like all the panelists to please share their opinion on this because it would um, go a long way to help people who are still deciding why they should take an LLM in the first place. So the first question says, what informed your decision to undertake a master's degree? So we'll start with the Attorney General, sir. So yeah, th thanks again, I, and you don't have to start with me all the time. I, I don't mind, but I'm I'm happy to I'm happy to take the lead on this. Um, so I, if you notice from the profile, I actually did an LLM prior to my going to Queen Mary. I, I did an LLM firstly at uh, the London School of Economics. So um, in choosing to go to Queen Mary, I actually didn't apply for an LLM. I applied for the diploma in international commercial arbitration. And when I got there, um, I was taking uh, commercial, commercial investment, uh, investment arbitration, commercial arbitration, and then I decided to shadow one course, which was commercial litigation. And in shadowing it, I was enjoying it so much, I decided to take it instead of just going to watch and, and uh, not gaining any recognition from it. So I converted to an LLM from that uh, uh, diploma program. But what informed my decision to go there? So uh, I practiced in a litigation law firm. I was called in 2006 and, and I started practicing immediately in a, with one of the senior advocates in Abuja, Patrick Equator. So we did a lot of litigation work and we started doing a lot of arbitration work. And with arbitration, I felt that was an area that really connected with me. And I wanted to develop myself a lot more in, in that area. So. I felt the, uh, uh, well, at that time, a diploma would be very advantageous, but then the LLM, as we'll probably see going on in this conversation, has been extremely advantageous for me. So for me, it was a conscious decision. How can I um, stand out in the crowd? Because I, as you know, the legal market in, in Nigeria, depending on who you ask, uh, they they're either say there are too many lawyers or they're not enough, enough lawyers relative to the population. But what I do know is it's extremely competitive. And going forward, Nigeria having signed on to the AFCFTA, the Continental Free Trade Area, it's going to get even more competitive because we're essentially going to open up legal services markets to, to other African jurisdictions. So I wanted something that would enable me to stand out from the crowd. And I felt with the reputation of Queen Mary and as an institution, and also the reputation of those who were delivering the program, I felt it was the best option for me at that particular time. Very interesting. Thank you so much, sir. We would go to Idanasi. For me, it was a number of factors. So I would 
bearing in mind the, the audience that we have here, I'll, 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 I take it we have chat on house rules here. So I will be I'll try to be as brutally honest as possible. So I'd come in as, a, as an international student and I'd finished my master, my uh, L, LLB. And I was thinking, what's the next thing to do? So I don't know, but in my background, the, my parents had drummed this in my ears. The next thing you do is, you know, you get on to do your masters. And I started thinking about which schools to go to. And I must say that CCL has an amazing reputation. Uh, the lecturers are just top notch, the professors are top notch. So I applied to a number of, of, of the University of London schools. And also I applied for scholarships as well. And it, I got admission into quite a number of them, but CCL, what tipped my hand with CCL was, I also got a scholarship to, a full scholarship to take on, to go on to CCL. So that was amazing for me, but the quality of the the quality of of the education that I received was just top notch. We had experts coming from different uh, sectors, in, and as as uh, as the attorney general has said, I was able to. I think I took about six or seven courses because <laughs> I was shadowing with the others and I was just really soaking in all the knowledge and you know all the everything that I could get. I think I got too much from CCL. Um, and that was amazing for me. So I would say definitely a good place to go. It did set me in the right direction for what I then moved on to do in my career. And uh, I I can't recommend this enough. Thank you so much. Um, how about Naimeka, as you go next? Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> the, the next, I smiled when you're talking about shadowing courses. Uh, same thing with the Attorney General, because it's funny how auditing courses some, somehow changes your perception um, and you go a totally different direction. For my part, I wanted to work in um, an international um, city. So it was either New York or London growing up. Um, I didn't even consider any other universities. It was just, it has to be university in London or university in New York. For the obvious reasons that they are close to the financial centers, all the financial centers of Europe and um, America. But over time, I leaned towards London as opposed to New York. And when I was doing my um, when I was serving and working in my first year, I had a chat with Professor Sibanjo who did his LLM and LSE. Um, and he spoke about London and, you know, working there, I was studying there and what that meant to him and how that launched his legal career. And I'd always admired that. So I applied to Queen Mary mainly to study uh, and you get that necessary experience in, in London. And for me, that was, it was central to my decision that I'd be in London. Um, but amongst the London universities, I looked at the courses I was interested in. I was interested in more commercial and transactional work and the quality of the professors that Queen Mary has swayed my decision. I think it also helped that my university, University of Lagos was offering a, a scholarship at the time. I didn't get the scholarship, but during the interview, I met so many of my colleagues there that, and, and I knew most of them were gonna be at Queen Mary as well. So that just combines to solidify my, my decision to say, I want to be in London, I want to be, you know, in Queen Mary, and I was going to have a good cohort to grow up with, to graduate with, and some of them are here. It's very interesting to know that Queen Mary ha has a very good reputation in Nigeria. It was actually, well, I'm not on the panel, but I'm sorry to say, um, I met one of my partners at the um, uh, 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 Baba Larkin and Co who studied at Queen Mary and when I was confused about what choice to make I started asking senior lawyers and everybody was just like of course you know where to go to Queen Mary it's, it's, not, it's not even negotiable and um, I see that a lot of Nigerians are beginning to embrace Queen Mary as well um, let's listen to Mr. Adesanya please well um, I suppose my case is slightly similar to the in, in the sense that it's well was almost automatic for me that after the LLB law school, the LLM was just 
the next thing that it's in, well, I'll do. I think probably because of the household I grew up in. However, um, in deciding where to go, I had gone to school, well, my undergraduate at the University of Exeter, I've been outside London, and I decided I wanted a London University, a change of field for starters. And when I started considering my options, I did apply to a number of places and got a number of offers, but Quimray seemed to then be the most appropriate place for me and what I wanted to do at the time. And coincidentally, oh, I'll be honest, my girlfriend at the same time got an admission to Quimray. She, well, she's now my wife. So it was a case of we both ended up going on to Quimray for LLM at the time. But in terms of, well, the personal reason or what I was, what informed the LLM itself, I think was an opportunity to increase my knowledge and contribute to well, legal research. And also it was a stepping stone to the PhD, which I eventually did. So, I mean, it was almost automatic that if you did want to get a PhD at the end of the day, you had to do an LLM. So that's why I said I was sort of programmed into it that it would just follow as the natural order of things. But in terms of my options, uh, it was probably one of my best options at the time. And you talk about shadowing classes. I remember I'd gotten into Quimary and I picked my modules quite a number and a friend of mine who was also doing his LLM said oh Abby why would you come and try the, out this course come to telecoms law with me I had no interest in it whatsoever I said okay why not I went to the class and 30 minutes in I'm like okay I'm definitely going to sign up to this and today I have a PhD in telecoms law so it, I mean it just happened just one of those things but that more or less sums up how I ended up in Primary. Dr. Adesanya, I can totally relate to that, picking a course, having just walked in and thinking, I'm just going to audit it, you know, after one class, you're like, you know what, this actually I'm sounds like I'm going to I, do this. The other course for me was also international commercial litigation, actually, conflicts of laws. So, so that, that's the one I started shadowing. Um, literally in the first few minutes as well, I was I was completely hooked. So um, yeah, you, you never know where you will end up. There's just so much on offer. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'll, I'll add to that to say I shadowed the ethics uh, ethics law and I shadowed financial regulation. And yeah, <laughs> and that literally just landed me where, where I got into where I entered into private finally, because I just thought, wow, financial regulation, who the thought? <laughs> and then the ethics of it was all as well, it was, yeah. So I would I would definitely say um, it, it, that opportunity to audit from Queen Mary. I don't know if any other I don't know if it's offered anywhere else, but but I boy, it was great to have that to have that option. Thank you very much, um, Doctor Adisa. I think you you had a very good reason to go to Queen Mary. I must say. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the problem with factors. <laughs> yeah. So I must say that from the experience I had or Kusema and I had because we studied in the midst of the pandemic. Um, so it was interesting to see how the, how the school had set up the system to ensure that we had at least a teaser of what each course had to offer um, prior to selecting our courses. So at least we don't go in blind. And they had like this two week window where they allowed you to like um, shadow for on shop and then just combine it's like someone that's making um, food you just start combining like different courses to just see what exactly fits your fancy. And I think for myself like in the maker I think what made me choose Queen Mary really was was the fact that London is commercial center of the world, and it was going to be a University of London school and then Queen Mary just seemed appropriate for me, so I think my next question is going to be targeted first to the maker, which is that. Do you, do you, yes, I understand that you chose Queen Mary because the London is the commercial center of the world, but do you have any particular memory of your time at CCLS that just makes, makes your experience stand out? I mean, there's so many um, to draw from, but one that might be a bit more interesting to the panelists here or to the audience here. Um, when I was at CCLS, the school, the LLM department organized um, interview sessions with 
the firm I eventually got a training contract with. The, okay. It was just a mock interview where they take a CV, run you through the process, um, give you feedback, um, and that was supposed to be it. Um, and it was on a first come first serve basis. So in those days, you just have your phone on you. Any email that you get, you see, I had my CV already attached somewhere ready to go. So once you see that, you're firing your CV up because that's what I wanted then. Um, and because CCLS organized the, that interview in coordination with Fresh Reels, I was lucky enough to be one of the first people to send my CV in, had a mock interview with them. It went well. And the person I spoke with that day just said, you know what, you should apply. It wasn't a promise or anything. It was just, you should apply and we'll look at your application when you, you know, put that in. But in terms of fond memories, like there's so many others, but for me, CCLS directly contributed to helping me get my training contract. So there you go. I think that's amazing, really. It's the, my experience was different, but I think it was, it's really amazing. And I think the careers team also at Quimari proves to be very useful and helpful because they help with like CV reviews, cover letters, mock interviews. They are, the, I cannot rate them. I cannot speak highly you know, of, of them enough, they, they are really fantastic. And the first people you should really be speaking to if you're thinking of having a career or working in, in London are the careers people at Queen Mary, both those in my land and both and those targeted for CCLS itself. It's very helpful. I completely agree. Idanesi, do you have any particular memory at your, of your time at CCLS? I think I, 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 think I would struggle to, to pick one particular memory at CCLS. Uh, There's it, too many to pick from, but I would say we had a, sorry, I will digress. So I remember when Minneka was preparing for his mock interview with Sheffield Fresh Hills, and we, <laughs> and we were in the library, and he brought you over to see and said, tell me, okay, <laughs> so what will be of the land? How do you do this? So as you were saying that, just that flashed in my mind. And you know, this is just, again, say just fun memory from CCL. And I'm forever grateful for that. Thank <laughs> you. you know, in so many ways, but carry on. Yeah. So I would say my a particular fun memory I have is when we had, um, there is a, a top lawyer from Clary, Clary Gottlieb. Uh, uh, I think his name is uh, Bushet. He's deemed to be the god of, well, the god in, of, uh, of debt, that is um, sovereign debt. And he came to give us a lecture. Uh, I, I believe it was on the, in the, on the campus. Uh, it's the dental campus. So it's a huge auditorium and you know, it's full to just to the top. And to hear him, you know, just share his knowledge about the Greek, the Greek debt finance, and you know, just talk about the world view on telling governments how to borrow, and you know how that directly impacts their economies. I think that really marked me. Um, just having that opportunity to listen to this person who's who's done so much and who's had such an impact. Of course, I think it brought to me how important it is to be to be good and committed to what you do because it then has a knock-on effect on lines. So the work he's done as a lawyer in a law firm has impacted economies across the world, Argentina, Greece, even the States, uh, and in those economies, people's lives as well. So I think that's that's one memory that I that I would that would be a fun memory that I have of CCF. I think that's interesting because he was also invited like during our time um, by Professor L Rosa Lastra. So I, yeah, she, I think she invites him every year and his session is really amazing. Kusame. Thank you very much. I think I'm also learning, uh, you know, moderator slash participant in this session. <laughs> so I will direct the next question to Dr. Adesanya and the Honorable Attorney General. What was your program experience like? And did you believe you were getting good value for your money? So I think why this question is important is because um, we came to school during the pandemic, people from all over the, you know, different countries. And there was a time that throughout, um, you know, the universities in UK, 
particularly the Russell Group schools, students were clamoring for fee reduction. And it seemed like the university's hands were tied and they couldn't really do anything about it because on the one hand, they were also supporting students who had issues during COVID because students could not really find jobs. So government was also like giving out like 500 pounds to students, 1,000 depending on your situation. And then on the other hand, international students were clamoring for a fee reduction and some people were heard saying that they are not getting the value they wanted. Well, I always said I had a different experience, maybe because of CCLS, okay, because other schools are there. So now they keep asking these questions. Is the LLM good value for money? So based on my experience, I, I tell them that yes, my current LLM is good value for money. But how about your experience? Let us know. Because you already, I, um, uh, Mr. Isaiah, you already had an LLM before. So we would like to hear your perspective, um, including that of Dr. Adesanya on that. Right. Would you like me to go first? Or I'm happy for Dr. Adesanya to go first. Oh, by, by all means, you go first, please. OK, many, many thanks indeed. So um, I, I think that's a really important question. And in fact, the, the answer I would have given to the previous question also speaks to this one in terms of the value you get. Now, for me, one of the biggest value, and, and it's, I, I understand it's relative, that term, what is value for money? So for me, the biggest value add were the relationships I made while I was at Queen Mary. And I think we would have had that relationship, whether it was a physical or whether it was a virtual program. So let, let me give two examples. So recently um, at, the, at the Ministry of Justice, we are introducing new legislation in Delta State to reform both criminal and civil justice. So for the civil justice side, we are looking at examples from other jurisdictions regard, relating to uh, the relationship between mediation and court proceedings. And a lot of work has been done in jurisdictions like Italy, Turkey, and in particular, Greece. And I remember I reached out to, I, I was looking for a particular piece of legislation. Uh, we found it, but we could only find a Greek version. So I simply reached out. So yeah, I, I know somebody in Greece who I met at Queen Mary. So I just reached out. It was as if we never lost touch, just chatting, seeing what everybody was up to. And, and we got the English version of it, which was very useful for us. Likewise, second example was uh, one of my supervisors, uh, specifically uh, Professor Maxi Scherer, who supervised my dissertation. So uh, if you've ever had a chance to speak with Maxi, she is absolutely fantastic. Uh, I, I, we, I can't recommend or commend her enough. So um, I remember I saw her about three years after I graduated. It was at IBA in Washington. I want to believe it was Washington. So she saw me and we again, we were just catching up, asking what I was up to. And she says, oh, um, she remembered the dissertation I did, which in and of itself is amazing because she supervises hundreds, if not thousands, as you can imagine, on a yearly basis. So uh, she was like, oh, Queen, Queen Mary is doing an alumni event. Oh, I'm sorry, doing an event on arbitration in Africa in Paris. And they're looking to, for somebody, preferably an alum, to speak on investment arbitration. And she says, oh, that relates to your dissertation. Would you want to speak? And I, I was just so excited. I was I'm like, oh yeah, definitely going to Paris. I didn't, I wasn't imagining I would have to pay for it by myself. I was still a very young lawyer at this stage, uh, paid for everything by myself, the flights, the hotels. And then I looked at the panel who was going to be there. And I absolutely was quaking in my boots. I, I can't use the word I wanted to use, <laughs> to use just now. But um, I, I went, it turned out really well, and I made even more connections. I, I met people like uh, Professor Emilia Onyema, who's from SOAS, and with whom I've done the SOAS Arbitration in Africa survey. Uh, from that, I was able to meet people like uh, a gentleman at the ICC called Tunde Bunshetan. He's, he's no longer there. But through him, I, I got an opening into ICC arbitration, um, uh, was fortunate enough to be appointed as an arbitrator, spoke at ICC events, 
became an ICC representative in, in Africa, the Middle East, and Turkey. So to me, those relationships, you can't put a price to that. It is absolutely, uh, it, it's valueless to me. So if there was one thing I would say was value for money, other than the, the teaching, the relationships you build, and I, I think you really have to hold on to it because that will be your network for life, pretty much. Um, I hope I've answered it satisfactorily. If there are any follow-up questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them, but I want to give a doc doctor a chance to speak as well. Uh, thank you. Well, um, in my case, was it worth the time and value? I'd say yes, but I would let, from a financial point of view, the financial climate was very different. This was 10 years ago or so. The exchange rate wasn't as ridiculous. So if, just looking at the numbers, it didn't cost as much as it costs today to have an LLM at the time. And I'd had a previous degree as an international student in the United Kingdom, and with an LLM being almost automatic, the cost just seemed relative, or it followed if it made any sense. So maybe I'm, in terms of the finances, that's probably one thing to say. However, um, the pros, for other people, I'd say there are different reasons why an LLM might be worth time and money. The answer is relative. For certain people, it increases your prospects of jobs, employability. That's one thing for certain people. If, for example, you had gone to school in Nigeria and you wanted to work abroad, there's, I think there's a certain prejudice, um, maybe against Nigerian degrees to an extent. So you probably want a foreign degree as well. And so that's one factor for people. Networking opportunities, like the um, Honorable Attorney General has said, is something that's very valuable from the LLM experience today. Some of my closest friends were from the LLM program. Um, for some people, the LLM might be an opportunity to travel and to live somewhere else. So you're not only paying for the quality of teaching, but you're also paying for that experience. That's part of it. Some people, it's an opportunity to specialize. There's also the stepping stone to the career in academia, so as you, you would say. So there are a number of factors why you can say an LLM is worthwhile. Um, there isn't one answer. And I think everyone needs to look at the pros for them and the, and the cons and then wait out, is it worthwhile in my case? I think that's the best way to go about it. But is there a simple yes or no answer in that regard? There isn't one. There are a number of reasons which might apply to you and might not apply to the next person. If I can just add something, because while Doctor was speaking, um, something resonated with me. And that is to say, you, you, you have to look at it as a long-term investment as well. So um, the, the costs are high, definitely. It's, it's a big cost. So as Dr. said, you have to weigh it up. You have to balance these costs against what do I hope to achieve from this? So you really have to think it through that. W will this actually help me in where I want to be in five, 10 years time? And, and if it does, then it's a worthwhile investment. You, you remember you're investing in yourself and in, in your career. So try and keep one eye out on where will I be long term? What, what, what will this do for me long term? And uh, once you sort of weigh it up like that, it, you tend to feel better putting in that cost because you know it's an investment that will pay off. Sorry, Sorry just, if I may just add, okay, go ahead, Namika. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Um, just to add, in addition to weighing up the financial costs, you also want to weigh up the time cost because what else could you be doing with that one year? Whether you did it during the pandemic, as Dr. Kusimia did, or whether you do it now, now we're getting out of a pandemic, weigh up the time cost and ask yourself, what else can I be doing? What other value can I be getting within that one year? So that you're looking at it in the round. You're considering all the factors. And then for you, you make a decision that it is worth the cost, both financial and time, to do the element. Sorry, doctor. No problem. What I was going to say is actually, while the attorney general was talking i remembered an experience i had back in law school and it also boils down to the to the time factor you have mentioned and it was while i was in law school a couple of us were privileged to have a sit down with well late justice nikki toby of the supreme court at the time in his house and while we all sitting there he just asked us that oh i know of you planning to do an llm and a couple of us said yes this and that and he looked at us and he goes 
you're still in law school, you're young, that if you want to do a postgraduate degree and you're interested, don't think about the money now. Go and do it now and get over and done with it. And he said something, he said, eh, even PhD too, that if you start earning money, you won't want to go back to school. So the earlier you do it, the better. And this was a very informal conversation, but it's something that stuck with me. And I think, so it was just a case of let's get it over and done with, sort out the academia part, and then we can now work on the actual career and the practice to an extent, but everyone has a different journey. But that's just, well, one insight I had that informed my decision to go ahead with the LLM almost immediately afterwards. Thank you very much. I, uh, um, okay, please go ahead. Uh, just to add to the conversation, I think also for students in Nigeria who are thinking of using the LLM as a stepping stone to migrate and you know, come and join an international workforce, I would say that is, you, you can then weigh that, put that into, factor that into your, your, your weighing the cost and your long-term goals, what your long-term goal is with getting the LLM. For example, with the UK now, the rules, the government have changed the rules so that you're allowed to have, to have I think it's two years extra on your visa after you, you graduate on the visa and you don't have to be tied to an employer. So that two years, if you wanted to join the workforce here, yeah, allows you time to do your research, go for your interviews and find, and find a job and you know, try and get yourself sorted. If that is you know, one of the things, or if that's a big factor in your decision to take an LLM, I just thought to mention that as well. Thank you very much. Many of the things the panelists have said resonate with me because some of them are the reasons why I chose to have an LLM. Um, also, Dr. Addison is saying that once you start working, to go back to school is, <laughs> you struggle a bit, but I think just win the long-term cost. I think it all boils down to win the long-term cost and um, also your, your intention. If you, you want to translate your degree into that jurisdiction to begin work again, an LLM may be a good um, stepping stone. So just coming back to you, Dan Essie, um, you mentioned, so in terms of what you studied and what you do now, what, what the question I have is, was there any significant change in your career trajectory post um, master's that your LLM at CCLS contributed? And those, is there anything you do now in your current role that you learned as a result of your, your, your program? Um, so my LLM, like, as I mentioned, I, I audited the ethics course, ethics and finance, yeah. and the financial regulation course. And that sort of gave me an inroad into thinking about financial regulation. This was just coming off the back of the, uh, the last financial crisis and you know, regulators were thinking about what to do. You found that many people acted downright criminally and they couldn't send anyone to jail. And so they were thinking, you know, how can we change the rules to ensure that A, we can hold people liable, send people to jail and B, we can stop um, bankers from acting irresponsibly. And, you know, just putting shocks to, to manage the, the, the financial system. And we had, we had an interesting character from the now collapsed Lehman Brothers coming to tell us, yeah. uh, to talk to us about, you know, what the culture was like uh, at Lehman Brothers. And that really got me interested in banking. I, I hadn't, I wanted to go into public practice. I hadn't considered going into banking at all. Um, but that really just got me interested in the banks. And I decided, you know, off the cuff to just try to apply for an internship at, at Morgan Stanley. I did. They called me in and, you know, and I got the internship. And it, it was off my knowledge of, you know, what I would listened to or what I, what, you know, what I gleaned from the financial regulation uh, course. And, you know, also, also ethics because I went into compliance. Um, all of that set me up to get into compliance within the bank. And I got into the bank and realized actually, I quite like, I quite like it here. And, uh, and, then, and I just thought, okay, let's see, let's see how this goes. So the, the thing was, okay, let's see how far this goes. And then in fact, 
if at some point I, I still feel the itch to go back into private practice, I can always have that option to go into private practice. Uh, and for, for people based here in the UK, if you're thinking of a career in the UK, you also have that flexibility. You can decide, okay, I want to come into private, into, into banking, come into compliance, which a lot of uh, lawyers are doing. And you know, you also have the door open to go back into private practice if you want to, if you chose to do so. So I would say the, the roundabout answer to your question is yes. Thank you very much. Kusame. Thank you so much. And um, this particular question is not so different from the value for money question, but uh, somebody asked, and I'm going to address it to Mr. Bozimo and Naimeka. Somebody has asked, um, what is the value of an LLM to a full-time litigation lawyer? Because like um, uh, Dr. Adesanya said, he did PhD. So an LLM is a stepping stone to a PhD, especially if you want to go into the academia. But I am in litigation. I want to be a senior advocate of Nigeria. And the qualifications or the, the requirements for becoming a senior advocate has nothing to do with having an LLM. So someone is asking, what is the value of an LLM for a full-time litigation lawyer? So um, the, the typical answer any lawyer would give, right, is it depends. It depends on what do you want to use it for? Uh, if, you're, if you're a full-time litigation lawyer, uh, are we to presume that you have no interest in uh, arbitration or further in your for further in your education for a, a specific or given purpose if you're a full-time litigation lawyer do you need an llm to succeed no you don't but there might be something down the line for which you find that an llm would be useful and we've already discussed some of those aspects here so for me um, i was in full-time litigation but like i said I was also in arbitration practice, and I felt that this is an area that I have a lot of interest in, and I, I really want to go into it in addition to my litigation practice. So that's what informed my decision to do an LLM. Uh, has it been worthwhile? Absolutely, because um, in terms of arbitration in Nigeria, arbitration in Africa, I think I've been very fortunate to have been involved at, at quite high levels, both in Nigeria and in Africa. So to me, it was absolutely worthwhile uh, in, in terms of the substantive knowledge that I learned. And more importantly for me, in terms of the network, which is, is absolutely priceless, do not underestimate the power of a network. In whatever it is you want to do, these people will open doors for you. So um, it, it really depends. It depends on where, where do you see yourself in five or 10 years? Uh, do you, do you uh, is your current litigation practice sufficient enough to get you there? If it's not, what else do you need to do? So it's, it's something, uh, there is no yes or no answer. Like I believe uh, Dr. Desoyen said earlier, that there's no yes or no answer. It's really a case of weighing up these different pieces that will make up your overall puzzle. So um, I, I, again, I hope that's a satisfactory answer, but if it's not, feel free to throw, throw a follow-up to me. It's definitely satisfying, thank you. So Dr. Happy for you to go for it as well. Um, well, in this, well, the question wasn't directed to me, but I was hoping I'd say something after you, because, well, as a matter of fact, I am a full-time litigation lawyer. That's why I wanted you to go for it. <laughs> I have an LLM in corporate and commercial law. I don't do that much corporate and commercial law. For me, it was an experience to try out the specialty of corporate and commercial law. And for me, I found that, okay, my interest is telecoms out of everything I've, I've done. That was my peculiar interest. And even though I'm mainly a litigation lawyer today, I still do a lot of telecoms related work. Loads of my clients are in the telecom sector. So it does help. And like I'd earlier said, there are other perks to the LLM itself other than actual specialty you gain from it. So if you look at it in terms of just or maybe the knowledge you're gaining for it, then you're having a close-minded um, view of the LLM. There's a lot more to it. But saying that you're a litigation lawyer and you want to become an SAN, do you need an LLM? I, I don't think 
that means you don't need one because my goals are also to become a silk one day. Everyone just has a different trajectory to go about it. So yeah, that's more or less my answer. There are loads of perks to an LLM. So the fact that you might not, it might not be directly related to your area of practice should not dissuade you from taking, getting an LLM, if that makes any sense. What, one thing I would add, uh, I'm so sorry, so sorry, no, I, I can't really speak in, yeah. Uh, one, one thing I would add to that is even if you're in full-time litigation, you have to have one mind on the fact that specialism is going to become even more important going forward. Why is that? Because there, there's a discussion now as to, and I, and I alluded to it earlier, do we have too many lawyers? Are we churning out too many lawyers than the market can handle? Uh, and the other, the, the flip side, I, I personally don't think we are. I just think we have too many lawyers doing the same thing. So we, we have to now start thinking about specialization. And that's one thing an LLM will equip you for, to become highly specialized and to stand out from what is seemingly a very large, large crowd, at least from the Nigerian perspective. But I suspect in whichever market you, you want to practice. And sorry, to add to the points um, that have been made by Vice General and Dr. Desai, as a litigator, particularly the way the Nigerian court systems are now, you're going to spend half of your time drafting and writing. You're writing briefs that you need to file. You're, yes, you'll be in court, but half of your submissions are going to be written. And the LLM is a fantastic way to improve your writing, your legal writing, your legal research. Because at the end of the day, the, court, the cases are out there, but finding them and you know using them in the way that helps your argument is what separates one litigator from another litigator. Um, and being able to marshal your points in a convincing way. Those are skills that you pick up doing an LLM. So if you're focused on being a litigator going forward, the LLM would give you that in terms of helping you improve your personal practice and how you write and draft briefs. Obviously, when you come back to Nigeria, people are always like, leave everything you've learned in school, come and learn how we do it here. And to some extent, there's a Nigerian way that yeah, you need to make sure that you convince the courts how best you know they, they prefer to receive an argument. But still, the, the lessons you learn, fundamentals about drafting, writing, research, I think those are very important and you pick up those skills doing an element. I'm sorry I keep uh, interrupting, but uh, again, Anameka has said something that I, I see on a day in, day out basis, right? How to persuade with writing and uh, let me let me give an example i remember during one of my um not not the lectures it was one of the the seminars the smaller the smaller fo focus groups and uh the gentleman who was taking us during that particular topic it was in commercial litigation he was also a lecturer at the university of cambridge so uh, what the idea is that you would read the problem scenario and you would go into these focus groups and you would discuss and work your way to an answer. And I, I looked at it and I thought, yeah, this, this seems quite straightforward. Do this, this, and this, you end up with the answer. So I went in there, threw my answer down on the table and he said, well, have you thought about it from this perspective? And he blew me away. Absolutely, I had not thought of it from that perspective. So whenever I write now, we always look at, well, what about this perspective? What about this perspective? What if this argument fails? So without, without that experience of the LLM, my writing would be nowhere as, as good uh, well, as what I think it is, it is now. So uh, Nemeka, that's a fantastic point, And it's one that should not be uh, overlooking at all. I was going to add to that before the honorable uh, attorney general also had his comments. And really, the point of the matter is there's no knowledge that's really lost once you gain it. And as a matter of fact, I'm a litigation lawyer and I can say in the last two and a half years, I do not remember arguing a brief at the Court of Appeal. You simply come and you adopt your brief and you go. So definitely the, that tells you that the quality of your writing matters a lot, even though you're uh, in litigation, because apart from in the trial court, there isn't much advocacy going on in terms of arguing against the next person orally. 
nowadays they want to well the course list is back it's full they have 20 matters in a day they tell you adopt your brief and they adjourn and they give you a further date that's what happens in the supreme court and the court of appeal so the ability to write well counts a lot if you look at it like that just the ability to research properly to put down your points in a well a persuasive manner and explain your points coherently in the way that anyone ideally with a decent understanding of law should be able to understand how much more the justices of the Court of Appeal or whatever court you're before. And, and, and it's also critical thinking, right? Because there's a course, I think, at least there was a course of critical thinking and writing um, in law. And yeah. I found that course interesting because yes, you generally write and you think about writing, but when you talk about critically thinking and writing for law in particular, it's a totally different scenario. And that's helpful for litigators where you have a scenario where on the face of it, oh, this case is bad and everyone says there's no argument. And the cases I've always, I used to enjoy when I was in Babalaki and Kwan and someone's Kupa, were those that almost seemed hopeless on the face of it. And then someone will come up with, well, maybe there's this preliminary objection you can raise. And that's a very typical Nigerian thing. But half of the time you're thinking that preliminary objection makes no sense until someone who can make sense of it, argues it and then writes out the brief and gives it to you. And all of a sudden, you're buying it and going, you know what, I, I, I buy your argument, let's make this case. And, go. and half of the time, sometimes you lose, sometimes you win. Um, but that's the beauty of understanding and being able to critically analyze um, issues. And the LLM gives you that. So. And if I may just say, although there might not be a particular LLM, maybe CCLS that's litigation oriented, there are a couple of courses that are relevant to litigation. For example, international commercial litigation conflicts of laws. You might not end up having the specialty or your LLM being named after, but my LLM is corporate and commercial law, but I did have that experience of going through that course and I had that knowledge. And I have applied it a couple of times in actual practice, especially when it comes to matters that involve different jurisdictions and stuff like that. So, and the way litigation works out is each scenario is different. So while litigation is one area of law, you might be dealing with litigation that's construction re related to there, something that has to do with finance. So really and truly, it might still be relevant to your actual practice, your litigation practice. And even as a, a litigation lawyer, you don't limit yourself to only litigation work. I, I still do corporate work from time to time. It might not be your bread and butter, but I don't think as a lawyer in private practice, you really turn down any work unless you, you think you don't have the expertise at all, or the clients will be better served elsewhere. Uh, and, and the final point I wanted to add, I'm so sorry before we move on, uh, was again, the, this point on, on critical thinking. You know, uh, I remember during one of our lectures from uh, Professor Julian Liu, who was saying, you know, the, the most brilliant writers are those who can make it sound as simple as possible. So one thing he used to tell us was to do, will it pass the first year LLB test? That is to say, if you write an argument and you give it to somebody who is in day one in their LLB first year, will they understand it? That's the level of simplicity you need to get to. And it's actually really difficult to get to that, that level of simplicity, but these are some of the skills they will teach you. And in, in practice, we've used it. So we, we've had cases, as, as Namika said, where it seems as if there is no answer to this until somebody finds it and says, let's try this out. I'll, I'll, I'll break down the scenario and let's see if we can argue it out. So it's a, another very important skill you will learn. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question, someone is asking here that which is more advantageous between an LLM or a qualification course in another jurisdiction. And I, I think this is particularly very important because I remember when I was a few days to come in, into the UK to undertake my LLM at Queen Mary, I was speaking with a friend who was in University of Law taking the LLM LPC, that, the combined course. And I, I was like, ah, man, I could have taken that one now because, because <laughs> I, realized that, I realized that it was kind of like a, a a route to qualification and LLM wasn't. And I, I realized that I may have needed to maybe undertake an extra course or maybe now an SQE 
or a qualification course to become qualified within this jurisdiction. So I think my question will be targeted towards Nemeka because you, I believe you, you, you work here. So, and I, I assume you're qualified because you, you, you did a training contract. So just having a full spectrum of it, um, which is more advantageous, an LLM, or if I have just, for example, if I have just 20,000 pounds to spend and I want to come to the UK, which should I undertake? Because I don't plan to go back to Nigeria. Should I take an LLM or should I take a qualification course and why? That's an interesting question. One that, as much as I'm qualified here, I, I didn't take the LPC, so I can't speak to the, the it, it's what they require for most places, but the good thing about the firm I trained with didn't require me to do the LPC, just the QLTS, the Qualifying Lawyers Transfer Exam, as it was then. Um, to your question, is between a qualification course and, and an LLM, I think, at least for me, you know, the LLM at the time gave me several options, right? I could, and doing the kind of school I was doing with it, being Queen Mary, there was the option of doing a PhD after that, if I wanted to. There was the option of carrying on and going in to work um, like I'm currently doing now. With the qualification courses, I don't know if they offer PhD programs, so one to look into, and I don't know how the LPC and LLM combo work if you can use that and go on and do a ph it's possible you can but it may be difficult to do it in the same university or the same course provider because if it's a cost they may be providing a phd option so if that's part of the things you're considering at all you know then you might want to bear that in mind and in terms of the 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 quality of the, the lecturers because we've spoken a lot about the names that the attorney general has dropped you know Julian Liu, Max Ishara, Max was my supervisor as well. Fantastic, fantastic um, professors, as well as the guest lecturers that you have. I feel the LLMs, particularly LLMs are as, as reputable institutions like Queen Mary, offer you additional things that you may not get doing a combination of a, co a, a, a qualification um, that's an LPC and LLM. So if you ask me, I, I would say the LLM still, because th that's my experience. But it doesn't invalidate or mean that if you do the LPC and LLM, you're unlikely to succeed as a lawyer, because that's not the case. Many people have done that and found their own ways to success. As the panelists have already said, there are several routes to success and you have to find out what works best for you. But if you ask me and you ask me the question, the LLM I believe is better because of the network, the quality of the lecturers, the quality of the guest lecturers that came in and the opportunities that it opened um, after the masters. So can I, can I interject as well? I would say, um, yes, do the LLM, but instead of, in any way, I suppose, think about what it is you want to ultimately achieve. So if you're doing, if you're coming here to the UK to do an LLM, um, and you're already qualified in Nigeria, there are other ways for you to um, qualify um, into and get into the UK market. So with now with the SQQE, I think the, the, the transfer course is going away with that. So you have that option. But if you do a master's, um, for example, aside from having that option of doing a PhD, uh, and giving you, first of all, you then get a degree, a UK degree. Uh, and if you want to do a qualification, you want to enter into the job market, uh, find your feet while still trying to get into the legal market. There are other things that you can do to keep, to keep you going that are not as expensive as the LLM, but, um, but can get you, get your foot into the job for the lack of a better word to use, uh, into the job market here in the, in the UK. So for example, you could do uh, like the project management course, that would also work for you as a lawyer. You could do that and then get into the, into, into the financial services industry, into another industry as a project manager. But then you have, so it's not gonna take as much time um, from you, time, time or as much money, it doesn't cost as much. Uh, so you have your degree, you have that qualification, you can then, you know, wiggle in and out of different places. It just gives you options. 
So I would I would add to say, uh, with the SQ, gosh, sorry, the name. It's SQE. 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 Yes, we do yeah. SQE. That it's it's a great option. Um, but I would still say, just so you have, if you want to come here. Um, if you don't have a job waiting for you here from Nigeria, yeah. I would say try get get in UKDB. I would say, and then there there are cheaper ways to go about getting the qualifications and you know navigating your way. Yeah, honestly, so, I think that's a fantastic point you just made about the different the change now to the SQE as opposed to the LPC route because I think they're changing. And again, I'm not so familiar with current rules for qualification but there is no longer the QLTS. And I think the LPC just have one exam now called the SQE that both students and qualified lawyers take, which is a solicitor's qualified um, exam. And what that then does, and the aim behind it is to open access to legal qualifications for people. Because even with the LPC and the LLM, the LPC LLM qualification, you're not still a qualified lawyer in the UK. You still need a training contract. and Training contracts are notoriously difficult to get. That's putting it mildly. Uh, don't tell you smiling because it's like I, I know what you're talking about, bro. But yeah, because it is it's notoriously difficult to get. So coming under the assumption that doing an LPC means that you will easily get a training contract, that's not the case. Also, doing an LPC doesn't make you a qualified solicitor. It means that you're eligible to then do a training contract or whatever is the next step there. But the change in the rules to mean that you have an SQE as the one exam that everyone can take after means you can do your LLM and then take the SQE after. I don't know if it falls under the 20K budget that Dutton made in its initial scenario, but we, we can work on that and discuss that later. Well, doing, yeah, a project, doing a project management course will, fall, will, uh, will neatly fall in that budget, I think. If I may also add, sorry, um, on what Unameka said, um, I actually don't think it's particularly fair to compare an LLM and an LPC. One is actually a degree, one is a professional qualification. Now, even the way the LPC usually works, um, as a, when I was, well, in the school in England, you couldn't even get a visa specifically for the purposes of coming to join an LPC. It wasn't something they would offer your student visa for. So if now we're having this discussion because now there's the LPC, LL, and the LPC, which is combined with the LLM. That's why we're having this discussion. But beforehand, they were in two completely different categories. And I'll stick by that. You still, if you decided to come do an LPC, um, you first and foremost would have to already have residency in the UK, if I'm not mistaken, unless you're doing a post-study with your post-study visa from your LLM, in which case there's the cheaper route of the SQE and formerly the QLTS. The QLTS, you simply pay for a couple of exams. You don't, and same as the SQ, you pay for a couple of exams. There are no attendance requirements for going to classes. So you don't actually have to be in the UK to carry out those exams. You can simply come in for a few days, write your exams and go back to Nigeria. So in, you shouldn't really compare the two. They're very different. The, the reason there's that debate is because the LPC can now be achieved with an LLM as well. But ordinarily, we won't be having that debate. If you had to come for the LLM, that offers you, well, different opportunities. You get to stay in the UK afterwards. And in the first place, you have a student visa. You can work for 20 hours. If you're coming to do the LPC straight out of, for example, you went to school in University of Lagos, you have a Nigerian passport. You would not be able to simply come and do the LPC without something else beforehand. So that's one thing you should bear in mind. Um, look at the requirements, the residency requirements and the perks of each. But if you're someone in Nigeria and you want to cross qualify and move to the UK, what I would simply advise you to do is to come and do the LLM. And while you're doing your LLM or towards the end, you enroll for the SQE. Um, a couple of my colleagues did it um, and they now work in the UK. So they came for the LLM, they picked up the QLTS and they ran with it. I was meant to do it at some point in time. I actually applied, got the certificate of eligibility, but I never got around to it. And with the SQE, I still intend to do it one day when I do find the time. But my point is, 
I don't, for, I, for example, I'm based in Nigeria and don't necessarily plan on coming to work in the UK or coming to come and resettle in the UK, but I still have the opportunity or qualified to practice in the UK. So it's very different to an LLM, which offers you a lot more, so to speak. Thank you very much for that. I think I would, I would just like to chip in on this as well, even if I'm not a finalist. And I think the fine point is there are two things. I think the first thing is, is that um, the mere fact that you do a qualification course, perhaps the mm -hmm. SQE now does not guarantee a job because there's a, I think the person asks that with, in, with the intention in mind to perhaps cross qualify and start working here. So I think that, that that is a very fine point that the mere fact that you have a qualification does not scratch the surface, the surface of the job market. It does not even scratch the surface of the job market. And then I think the second point is that an L, what an LLM does is that it gives you a buffer period of at least one year to get in, have a lay of the land, see what the, 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 the system requires you to do and then you, from there on, you can now decide. As a matter of fact, you may find out that after your LLM or during the course of your LLM, you don't even need to qualify to work in some of these international organizations, international law firms. Um, I know a number of people who they never really qualified in, 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 in the UK and they work in Ireland and Ovary. They probably work as international lawyers. They just register with the SRE as international lawyers. People like me, we never qualified while working in organizations um, in the UK, but they are sector specific like M&A um, or corporate finance, just debt financing, capital markets, and it never really requires it to qualify. Maybe after you start working and you now realize, ah, okay, this SQE thing, let me, let me just have a look at it. And just for better opportunities, perhaps, then you can go ahead to do a qualification exam. So I think someone in the audience, and those are, those are fantastic points that, that you made. Um, someone in the audience asked about doing an MBA instead of an LLM um, and considering whether that's worthwhile as a young lawyer. Listen, I, I wouldn't really know the answer because I haven't done an, an, an MBA. Um, I think an MBA is a fantastic, fantastic, you know, program if you want to do that. Um, but if you're looking to work in a law firm and the legal career is what you're looking to progress with and I don't necessarily think that you need an MBA again it's almost you know you have to decide what works best for you um I know I, I knew I knew I wanted to be a lawyer even though I was more interested in companies corporates transactions um and, and the MBA would be very beneficial to a lawyer who is looking to potentially change a career or work in a bank uh, or work in investment banking for instance if you're thinking of moving working out to Goldman Sachs or Bain, Bain and Co and McKenzie or whatever Yes, an MBA is fantastic because you have that and then you can walk in that particular field um, and it's fantastic for you. But if you're looking to carry on as a lawyer and you're interested in legal roles, whether it's in-house or private practice, whether it's litigation or transactions, then I, I would say focus on, on the LLM. But again, everyone has a personal decision to make on that. I think I, I would add to that to say it really depends on your path as well, what you want to do, how you want to progress. Think carefully about it. So if you are going into corporate law, corporate or commercial law, um, or you just you're, you want to come into the financial services sector, an MBA is a good to have if you can. Uh, some places add on an MBA to an LLM. I think Oxford to have a plus one thing you do where you can do an LLM, you can add one thing to, to a, another postgraduate degree. So if you can, um, you can look at places that offer you that option to have both. But if it is, if it's, if it's going to, only if it's going to further your, your, your prospects in, in the field that you've chosen to get into. Um, Again, if you, as a lawyer, if you have that commercial expertise, it's easy for you to become a banker. It's easy for you to become, you know, to go to move within. If especially if you if you get into a large international organization, you can move and do different things. So Goldman's have had a CEO 
their last CEO was a lawyer. Um, he was a lawyer until he became, he went into banking. And within Morgan Stanley, I've seen quite a number of lawyers who just moved from, they just moved from law into, into the proper banking side of the business. And I think if, I, if I'm not mistaken, our current uh, CEO, well, the current CEO for the UK is, is a lawyer. And she moved into banking, into the banking side from the legal side of, of, of the firm. So again, it really depends on your long-term um, the long-term goals and how that will make it easier or make it better or add value to to what you do. But if you're in com- if you're a commercial lawyer, you anyway already have those skills because by virtue of what you do, your day-to-day bread and butter, you already have those skills. Um, if you have the option as an add-on, you can do it. But I will agree with Nika that an LLM is is quite different from from an MBA. And if you do a commercial commercial uh proper commercial law MBA. I don't know if any one of you listening um, was in uh, what's his name, uh, uh, Professor Rodrigo Olivares' um, uh, classes. It's it's like yeah. taking an MBA. That guy is like a walking encyclopedia of IPOs and whatnot. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was in corporate finance. I think we were the first of the corporate finance. Corporate yes. finance and MA. Yeah. Yes, corporate finance, MA. And, and that so, was. Fantastic. It's one of those like I, I was going to audit the course and after listening to Professor Rodrigo, I was like, well, that's the course I'm taking. Yeah. Lo and behold, that's what I'm practicing now. So mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, and he and he's he's so so well regarded that he's like when they have when some of these big um private corporation um private law practices have specific issues that they need his expertise, he's, he's brought on to consult, uh, you know, and, and to give advice using his background and his knowledge. So really, I think the only thing that I, that I was missing from, from his corporate finance lectures was just financial modeling, <laughs> I think, uh, for me. So, but, um, but yeah, so that's, that's my two cents. If I may just oh. add to what Danesi said, I think the answer of LLM versus MBA, I think it's relative. They both have their benefits. I think um, an MBA has limited, well, applicability as a practicing lawyer, depending on what you're doing. I mean, there are certain niches that an MBA works out very well for you as a lawyer. But while it has limited applicability as a lawyer, it opens up other areas for you where you can act not only as a lawyer, but in other capacities as well. Whereas I think an LLM is, well, it, the applicability is mainly for lawyers, if that makes any sense. So that's one way to think about it. If you want to do something else that's finance related, maybe an MBA might be for you. But if you're looking to focus on practice itself, uh, most likely an LLM is appropriate for you to give a simple answer, but it's not that easy. It depends on which area of law you're looking to focus on and which other area you're looking to focus on as well, if it's outside law. So it's relative. It depends on everyone's um, career path, I guess, or their trajectory. Yes, um, and I would and I would add to that to say that uh, if you if you already have the legal expertise, and you know the finance is the financial area is where you're looking to get into, and MBA is out of us. But I agree with you, Doctor. Um, yeah, very quite point, fair point there. Thank you so much for the robust um, response. And I think he's very down to earth. And um, I'm sure the person who asked this question has some pointers now to what he should do. Okay, so I'm going to direct, um, well, not my question, question from one of the attendees is directed to the attorney general. And the question says, I am a young legal pr- practitioner, enthusiastic about international commercial arbitration. However, I am unsure as to whether to choose an LLM in comparative and international dispute resolution or to study international commercial law, which is the subject of most arbitration cases. I would love the Attorney General to please comment on this because this is area of expertise. Okay, uh, Kusama, thank you very much. And thank you also to uh, Biomi for, for asking that question. So, so the simple answer is this: um, an LLM in comparative and, or, and uh, 
international dispute resolution, it's determined by which specific courses you take. So if you take enough courses that fall within your specialty area, then you have an LLM in, in this case, comparative and international dispute resolution. But I think it was uh, Dotun who was saying earlier that one of the beauty with the LLM program is you have this buffet in front of you, right? So you can choose one course from here, one course from here. So I, I know people, for instance, who have done international commercial arbitration, international investment arbitration, and international commercial law, all in, all in one topic. And even if that doesn't get you a specialty cat, you still have an LLM that covers those three very uh, niche and specialized areas. So uh, the simple answer is there's nothing stopping you from combining commercial arbitration with uh, commercial law. You will tend to find that they, they, will never, they will overlap in terms of content. So that, that could be one route for you to take. The other one you might have to consider is if you're already involved in, uh, in practice and you have commercial experience and expertise, then you might want to then just focus on the specialist uh, arbitration and dispute resolution topics rather than the commercial law topics, since you already have practical experience in that. So uh, that's for me. I I'm sure others might have their views as well, but that's what I would suggest. I, I completely agree with you, Lieutenant General. And there, are, it's, you know, that's an example of, of food is the best way to or a, a, a five course, 10 course serving of a meal is the fantastic way to put it. It's, it's a buffet and then you get to pick and choose. Um, the good thing about Queen Mary is that you don't necessarily have to decide before you get there. Yes, you've applied for a particular specialization, but then that two week buffer period where you attend different courses and see what they have to offer gives you an opportunity to experience different areas and you can decide that, yes, I initially wanted to do an international in commercial law um, LLM, but I'm going to do that. And then my models would be dispute resolution and I'll have a, a, a arbitration in that international law um, LLM. The type, number of courses you can do underneath each of those subheadings are, are quite wide. And one of the reasons many people ended up doing corporate and commercial was because you could pick and choose different uh, models. So for instance, I did um, a course on arbitration, I did a course on corporate finance, I did a course on e-commerce. And when I was going to do my master's, I was like, I want to do a commercial course, I want to do an arbitration. And then the third one, I wasn't quite sure. But when I went in there, I listened to Professor Rodrigo and I felt corporate finance was fantastic. I, you know, Julian Liu was fantastic and Berkelakis was amazing. And so I was like, well, I'm definitely taking this arbitration course. And any e-commerce Professor Chris, you know, who's the lecturer there, at the time I was thinking, well, let's see, Google seems like an interesting area to consider. And then I picked that course. And you can mix and match when you actually start doing the course. So don't necessarily worry about well, what the LLM will be called in the end. You have that two week buffer to actually go to the classes, have a chat with the professors who are very approachable and it will give you the best advice. Um, but it, again, it has to be a choice that you make and what works best for you but give yourself the time to experience each of these courses to make a decision an informed decision apologies i have to drop off um i just wanted to apologize to you all i have a meeting that i need to get to but thank you so much it's been an absolute pleasure please drop me a line if you need if you have any questions for me um but uh what emika said and uh what jessa in general said in relation to this question i i think uh I would say that you have, there's, there's so much to on offer that you can pick and choose from, um, that you don't need to box yourself in. Uh, like Dotson said, the buffet, I can't, I can't stress it enough. The buffet is, is there. And as long as you, it, it really comes down to how much time you want to dedicate to it. Um, and, and if you can give it the time, you, you, you can, glean so much from all the other areas. So I did the energy arbitration as well. Um, yeah, I think I did, I did, I think I did most of different things. There are things that I audited that I didn't, I wasn't even officially audited. Uh, <laughs> so if you, if you tell me to do different things, I, I definitely can speak to different things. Uh, so I, that, that's, that's my two cents on this. Uh, uh, thank you for having me.
Thank you so much, Nanisi. I know that you've been here. It's been one hour, 30 minutes. The questions are still coming. Thank you so much for your time. And before we move forward, I would like to comment on the last question. Having studied comparative and international dispute resolution as well, I would like to say that the CIDR program is like procedural. It teaches you everything that has to do with the procedural aspects of international arbitration, whether it's international commercial arbitration or investment treaties arbitration. So if you know that you want to be in the practice or you want to be a counsel or an arbitrator, yes, that would be an ideal course for you because you're going to be like hands-on on the practice and the procedures. So, but even after taking CIDR, like they have said, you can now take courses on commercial law, corporate commercial law, as the case may be. I understand that we have other alumni who are here and um, Mr. Davis would like to introduce them. Perhaps they can answer other questions in the chat, but because we have, you know, choked our speakers with questions and questions and questions. Thank you so much so far. I think I've learned so much also. Okay, uh, first I'd like to thank all our speakers. Uh, I've had a very enlightening session. Um, also thinking maybe I should get a second NLM at this rate. Um, we have come to the end of our first um, session. So, I mean, we know our speakers are very busy people. So, I mean, if you want to drop off or you have some other engagements, um, you are permitted to leave or, yeah, I mean, you can always leave. But um, if you want to stay back, you know, I noticed that there are still many more questions coming up. Um, would like you to also, you know, stay back and, you know, exchange ideas. Um, some of our attendees are also alumni, so we just decided to include them in this um, second stage of um, uh, discussions. Um, we have Dr. Ola Yode, uh, Falawa Ajayi, Choma Olibie, Samson Egege, I hope I got that right, and Olu Shodimu. So um, I think we can throw questions to any of you know, these other alumni and you know, just exchange ideas. Um, there's a question that came in as to you know, um, I'm a current LLM candidate in UK with two years work experience in Nigeria. I would appreciate any advice on the required steps, skill sets and strategies LLM candidates can begin to do in order to transition to the UK workforce and work as a lawyer. I don't know if there's any takers, you know, on the panel. Um, but again, I would like to thank our speakers again, uh, the AG, Mr. Bozimo, Dr. Adesonya, and um, Inam Emekaeze, and um, Ida Nessi, who has dropped off. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Right, thank you very much. Uh, I, I also um, have to give my apologies at this stage, because uh, I, I have to drop off. But, but in, if I can offer an answer to that question, it would be uh, the advice Nameka gave earlier, which is, which is that to really take advantage of the career services uh, at at CCLS, both at Myland and at um, Holborn. So, um, if if you were listening earlier, he was um, he, he talked through the process of the practice interviews with Freshfields, I believe it was. Uh, I also went through that that process, uh, I, although I didn't. My intention was not to stay back in the UK, uh, but if if that was my intention, it would have been, and it still has been, a very useful process for me because it gives you a direct insight into what these international law firms are looking for primarily. And it helps you identify any gaps in your CV or in your experience, which they would want you to fill. So even if um, you, you feel your CV or your, your qualifications or your experience is not up to par, at least you then have a roadmap to say, okay, well, this is what I need to, to uh, fill. This is the gap I need to fill in order to get myself where I need to be. Um, so for, for me, that, that experience, it's the, the CV template I took from those discussions is one I still use now. Uh, the sort of extracurricular items that uh, uh, these firms are looking for is stuff that I, I always ensure that it's always up to date and also to tailor your, your experience and your CV depending on the particular role you're applying for. The, the, those are the things I took from that. So there is a fantastic support network at CCLS and amongst your colleagues who will be able to help you as well. 
So uh, I'm sure the other panelists will have a lot more to say on this. But at this stage, I, I have to, first of all, thank uh, the organizers for putting, putting this event on and for inviting me. Uh, I had a fantastic time. Nemika, I'll take you up on that drink. We'll, we'll certainly, uh, I'll make sure I, I get your contact details as well as the, the details of uh, Dr. Desson and the other, the other panelists. So uh, enjoy the rest of the conversation. And thank you very much again. Thank you very much. And I look forward to that drink. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Hello, I'm also going to have to go very soon. But if I may just say, in addition to what um, the Honorable Attorney General has said, I think um, my approach will focus on the actual reality factors and the legal requirements. I think the way you'd go about it is, if I'm not mistaken, you're entitled to a two-year post-study visa upon completion of your LLM now. In that case, the, the automatic thing, if for the person trying to stay on, will be to apply for the two-year post-study visa. In that period, maybe towards the end of your LLM, in addition to following up with the careers and trying to tailor your CV and all of that, you might want to look at starting, well, starting the SQE process, um, which is the qualification exam. Uh, it, even if you start it while you begin your LLM, it, it's very unlikely you would be able to complete all the exams before your LLM. And I'd say do it at the end so that you at least focus on your LLM to an extent. Um, in the meantime, while you're getting the qualification exams sorted, you might want to find employment um, in the legal sector, but maybe not as a lawyer, even if it means as a paralegal of some sort or something, while you're, well, trying to get qualified. When you are then fully qualified or in the process of qualifying, you can then apply for jobs as a lawyer in different law firms. But I think that would be the process really. But it's most likely there will be a gap between when you finish your LLM and when you're able to find employment as a lawyer. That tends to be the case with most people. And with other LLM students who stayed back, in the UK during our time, that was the case with a number of them. I know a couple of them found jobs as lawyers maybe a year afterwards, but going straight from the LLM into a job as a solicitor, it's uh, some people are lucky enough to get it, but you have to be ready for the transition period, more or less. Finding a stopgap in between, and then you have to qualify. And the route to go would be the SQE and not, well, there's no LPC again, again. Yeah. Anyway, so that, that more or less narrows it down. Uh, thank you very much. I think I'll just also chip into this. I, just, I, just like the person who asked the question, I have a very similar profile. So I worked um, two years in Nigeria at Banwo and Igudaru just before coming for my um, master's Sorry, here. Sorry, I'll, I'll just like to say my goodbyes to everyone at this point in time. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me on. I hope I've been able to offer some insight. And all the best in your journeys for those of you about to go for the LLM and those of you who have just completed it, all the best in your future journey going on. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, Thank Dr. you so Adesan. much, Dr. Desson. Okay, so um, what I was saying is Thank you I have much. a similar profile with the person and My what pleasure. I can say is, Thank you. What I can say is when you come, if and when you come for your LLM from day one, I think you should hit the ground running if your intention is to find an employment post LLM. So um, what do I mean by hit the ground running? So engage the career services team, have them look at your CV, um, have them look at your cover letter. Just it may not be a thorough review because they some of them may not have worked in those law firms, but at least it's a first stage review. I know QM also has engaged this system of, of mentorship. So they try to get people, um, lawyers within law firms who, who, who studied at CCLS at some point or the other. So you can get on that program as well. I was on the program. So I feel like that was very beneficial for me. And then um, more importantly, I think you, you may need to engage um, this social media network, LinkedIn. LinkedIn. LinkedIn proved very helpful for me as well. In terms of perhaps in my fifth month here, I was already having conversations with Link Letters, the head of recruitment for Link Letters, having conversations with Hogan Lovells. And that was just like from persistent, um, persistent review 
review upon review, had my mentor review my CV, had my the career services review my CV, even had people within those law firms review my CV because you could also look, I mean, people like Nemeka that work there, you can actually engage them or via LinkedIn and say, well, I'm a Nigerian, I came for LLM. I saw that you also went to Queen Mary. Please, what advice do you have? But, Maybe not give me a job, but what, because they don't have the capacity to do that. But what advice do you have and what steps did you take that I can take that will um, get me to where I need to be? And perhaps also just additionally, beyond looking within law firms, you can look at financial, the financial services industry. So you can look at um, even um, professional advisors, EY, Deloitte, Einstein, um, um, KPMG, um, Morgan, even financial services, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan. Um, our, and, and many of, or even Amazon aggregators, Sela Extrasio, these are organizations that do have sponsorship license, if I assume that you, you don't have a British passport or residency. And um, these are organizations that take on international lawyers because they are, they are, their services are international, they're not within just, just within the UK market. So what you find that your experiences in those, um, in those sectors, in your niche areas, May become very relevant to them, regardless of whether you're a Nigerian lawyer or you're in South Africa or yeah. Yes, they may prefer, yes, they may prefer someone within this jurisdiction, but just the fact that you are undergoing an LLM in the UK, they also believe that London candidates are usually very top-notch. So that could play out in your favor. So I think I don't I don't know if Nemeka would have some few things to add. No, no, I I agree with you, the points that you made. I think if you should be clear in your mind that you want you know a job or you want to get more good work experience in in london and from day one i, I wouldn't wait till the end of your masters because if you're waiting till the end of your masters i think that's a bit too late there is a benefit you get from being a student from approaching people and saying i'm currently studying at x it helps with your cold emails or reaching out to people on linkedin so my own strategy going in was from the jump I'm going to be A, reaching out to people. So my networking game, in fact, it was, I'm going to study 70% of the time, but 30% of my, my time whilst I'm doing my LLM is networking. That means reaching out to people to help with my CV, the careers people. That also included reaching out by, via email, cold emailing people I thought I found interesting, or I went to a panel and I heard them speak, or they invited them to the school. People who I thought I had commonalities with, whether they were Nigerians at international law firms, and just emailing them and asking, can I have a five minute coffee with you? That networking for me was very important. And I was doing all of this running around with some of the, some of the people here. So Mr. Sander, Mr. Falaha, Jai, we would <laughs> be attending classes. I'm saying, ah, we, we think there's a, this, you know, networking event coming up soon. We're going to go for that, you know? And it was part and parcel of doing the LM itself. And more importantly, speaking about it, talking about it, saying, listen, I want to do this. It's not something you want to do a hush hush in a private and then hopefully, you know, by God's grace, it will come on. Yes, by God's grace, God is on our side, but you need to put the work in. And that work means being able to deal with the, the hours that it requires, hours in A, updating your CV, knowing that's a different procedure and CVs, what people expect when your CV is different. I spoke of my mock interview initially and what stood out for me as I had practiced in Nigeria, but what stood out and what did the person, because I eventually met the recruiter I had a conversation with, I met her about four or five months later. And what she remembered was that, oh, I was working part-time whilst I was doing my LLM. And I was working as a building management assistant in one of the halls, um, watching and changing bulbs and making sure that things were running right in the halls in Queen Mary. That's what she remembered. And at the end of the day, your CV is just, listen, I want you to see this and remember me and then invite me for an interview so we can have a conversation. When you see it that way, there's a lot that people focus on generally in terms of, oh, I want to put all my legal experience. And in London, they tend to focus more on skills. So what skills have you gotten from any other thing that you've done? And if you have a CV, I mean, bear in mind that these law firms or organizations get thousands of people applying all the time. They try to find ways to cut down and for them, it's what's interesting, what picks our attention. Yes, you have legal experience in Nigeria. You worked as a lawyer. What else have you done? And if you can't go beyond that, what else? Then it's just, that's where you stop, unfortunately. So you need to find other things that you've done. Have you been, or your extracurricular activities need to jump out. And it's not just, I was in Mutuna, I was in Mut, you know, debating society, which is again, another thing that Nigerians and lawyers tend to do a lot of. People, the experiences that 
I have found that recruiters who read CVs and recruitment and HR people find interesting and people who've worked at malls or shops or worked as bartenders and waiters. And when you speak about the skills they care about for trainees and lawyers, you think, oh, that doesn't apply to a lawyer. But we talk about ability to handle pressure. We talk about organization. We talk about determination. We talk about resilience. I mean, you cannot be a, a waiter in certain busy restaurants without having some amount of resilience. And it's understanding that it is a skills-based CV, particularly for entry roles, particularly if you're, you just have two years experience from Nigeria. That's what they're focused on. They're focused on how can you translate and transfer those skills to being a good lawyer or being a trainee or being an entry level person at their organization. And it's emphasizing those skills, trying to get more of those skills washed during the UK and hitting the ground running in networking and reaching out to people to get more opportunities to learn more of these skills, but also show that you have learned these skills growing up. I think another important thing to mention as an aside is that whilst you're doing all of this, if, if you do hit the ground running and you start applying from day one and you understand how the legal calendar works for some law firms, because unlike Nigerians, they are very, very rigid in how they recruit, whether it's a training contract season or it's a vacation scheme season, I won't even bother with application schemes for some people because that's not how they recruit for LLM students. You have to know what they're, you know, whether it's targeted to year two students, second year students or to LLM students. But what I, I think is a very important skill to have is resilience. You will get no's, you will get rejections. It's, it's part of the cost. When people say no, it's maybe your CV didn't have something or there's something else that you need to do. What you need to do is pick yourself up, bounce back and apply and look for something else. But put your best foot forward at every time. And even though you may get no's, don't let those no's stop you. You know, keep knocking until you get yes. Keep asking the questions. Keep having coffees with people. Keep, you know, trying to get five minutes of people's times. Like I was called emailing partners in Clifford Chance, who I didn't know from Adam and just saying, hi, I'm this, I'm doing an NLM here. Um, I'm, I see you're Nigerian. I'm Nigerian too. And I would like to have a conversation with you. And it worked. I only say that because it worked. And that was one out of the 20 other people that I emailed and did not respond, you know, or ignored completely the emails. You have to, if you want it, you have to chase it more than anything else. It has to be the forefront. The first thing you wake up and say, okay, and you keep a record of it. Who have I reached out to? Who have I not reached out to? Who do I plan to reach out to? It feels like a full-time job and it almost was. But if that's your goal, again, the LM is what you make of it. If that's your end goal, then you need to, from the very jump, be clear about it and walk towards it. It's a long goal. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint, but it is possible. Thank you very much for that, uh, Mameka. Um, I mean, I can relate to a number of things you said there. Like, you know, you just have to hit the ground running. I remember you doing, um, you know, your your work in um, Queen Mary, you know, just going around, making sure that everything is, and I mean, as you said, it's a skill-based system. They want to know that you can, you know, interface with clients. They want to know that you can work on that pressure, you know, and I mean, I think those are the things that set, you know, people apart ultimately in the job market. It's not necessarily your, you know, first class or, you know, I mean, those things do matter, but, what really sets you out in the job market is the skills you acquired and really the skills you've been able to acquire within, um, you know, London or the United Kingdom. So you just have to put that in mind, you know, in volunteering, you know, in, you know, looking for, you know, different types of work. Um, I would like to call on, you know, one an alumni you know, who is not on the panel to just give us some perspective on some of these things. I don't know if Fola or Dr. Lai or Day can, you know, just say one or two things and then um, as the program is, you know, rounding off or any other person who, you know, who is willing to. I'm to okay. yeah. yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, please. Um, let Dr. Lai or Day go first. Um, Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes. Um, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for the organizers of this event. Um, sorry, I came in late. I was held up in the NAM meeting. But yeah, I mean, for me, what I've gained so far has been really been, it's really been good. So much insight. In fact, it was almost as if I, in my mind, I was just going back in time and just connecting to everything that everybody, a lot of speakers said, particularly from the last speaker, um, because a lot of the things he said I did. 
you know, doing, doing my time. And I think the master's is a valuable program. I agree. The master's is a valuable program. It helped me to find myself in what I wanted to do. At first, um, I was thinking, all. Oh, I mean, I did my master's in comparative and international dispute uh, resolution. And I thought I was good. That was the field I was going to because I, I was, I wanted to move away from litigation. And I wanted to, to, to see ways and possibilities on how parties can be able to resolve their matters instead of going through the long end of litigation, particularly for those who have practice in Nigeria, which could end up being a generation thing from generation to generation. And I was thinking arbitration and this resolution was the way forward. But in one particular class, in the alternative dispute resolution class, I also happened to be the only person that showed up for the class that day. My colleagues there really called me an epical, which was which was quite the case. But it provided the opportunity for me to, to, to have a chat with uh, Lucas Mustelis, who is still very much here, and who played a vital role in my decision to do a PhD. And for my discussions, we talked about restorative use of alternative dispute resolution and how it could be used not only in civil matters, but also in criminal matters. And I actually did an essay on that. Uh, but what I wanted to point out was that discussion with him, because the lecturers in QB are excellent, as we heard from some of the other speakers, in so many ways, particularly giving that advice, which can have far, far reaching impact than you, than, than you ever realize. It was through that discussion with him that made me realize, you know what? I want to go into academia. It was, I didn't know how I wanted how I was going to take those steps, but that 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 talk with him dropped like a light bulb that look, this is uh, I want to do. Now it was a long journey or the long process, but again, the skills which I got during my master's, the soft skills, writing, researching, helped me, you know, provided the basis for me to be able to start thinking about research proposals, writing a research proposal on to, you know, getting onto the PhD program, also the resilience, the, you know, the hard work and everything, also played a key role and contribution towards that. So the LLM is not just about academic, I mean, you know, getting a degree. I want to really emphasize that about getting a, a paper at the, end of the, at the end of the day. But more importantly, being exposed to people of vast experience in, in whatever field that, that might be of interest and getting those droplets of, and nuggets of knowledge and wisdom, which can be able to play a role in, you know, what in helping you shape your career. And I, I probably, without the LLM, I probably would not be, especially at Queen Mary, I might not be where I am right now. So to me, the LLM, it's, 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 it's for me personally, it was a necessary venture. And I strong, I mean, I advised any, I mean, I advised anybody to really, I think it's, how can I put it? Uh, particularly for a lot of us who have gone through the Nigerian education system in Nigeria, I think it was necessary for me to get that expression of a different form of and way of, edu of how education can be taught on how the law can be taught or what the law is. And probably again, without the other, I wouldn't know that. So, I mean, those are the few words I would just want to share. Anybody considering doing the LLM? Yeah, especially at Queen Mary, really do it. Of course, as what other, another speaker said, all those other um, um, issues, finances and everything also has to take in consideration, but where it's possible for you to do it, really go for it. Really go for it. Thank you very much, Doctor. I think um lastly, we'll just want whilst we round round up, we we'll want um Mr. Adebayo to speak uh, before we just take our closing remarks. Mr. Adebayo. Um okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um um, yeah, firstly, I would say a big thank you to the um, organizers. Um, it's been a very, very interesting program. I think um, I've learned a lot from, you know, what all the speakers have had to say. Um, from my experience, I would say that, you know, I'm not even over my LLM yet. Um, you know, 
almost on a monthly or I won't say weekly basis, a monthly basis. I remember, you know, something that has to do with that LLM. And um, like the last speaker said, um, I don't, I don't think I would have. I mean, my career wouldn't have taken this turn without the LLM. And um, um, you know, just like uh, Minemeka said, you know, myself BC. I mean, there was BME. There was a lot that we did. You know, the LLM, the academics. You know, it's important, but you know, um, if you are looking through my CV, for example, um, if you don't, if you don't look at my LLM, if you don't look at the portion where I put my education, you might not even notice that I did an LLM in London because all through the period, you know, I was doing you know some other stuff, some other legal experience, some was paid, some was unpaid. So like everyone has said, the networking is extremely critical. I mean, you have to, I mean, build relationships, you have to attend events. Uh, and you have to, I mean, there are some opportunities that wouldn't look like opportunities, but sometimes you have to be hungry enough to jump at even the slightest, you know, thing that looks like an opportunity. Um, there was a firm that um, um, a barrister set and um, 39 SX that I applied to, I sent an application very early on in um, when I got to London. Um, David Bremer Thomas was one of my teachers. Um, so I thought, well, I mean, let me, I mean, it might be helpful if I, if I send an application. I mean, they never go back to me. I think that was in um, November, 2013. And um, so what then happened was, I mean, I looked for other opportunities. And in July of um, 2014, there was an opportunity to go to, um, the, to go to Malaysia for an internship. Um, it's now called, it used to be called KLLC, it's now AIAC. So I, um, I applied, unfortunately, you know, I was selected, I was shortlisted. And even that itself was a challenge. I was also going to Malaysia where I didn't know anyone. I'd never been there. They were not going to pay me a lot. I was going to source for my accommodation. I was going to pay for my flight. So it didn't look too much like an opportunity, but I thought, well, I mean, if I can't get into World Bank yet, if I can't get the LCI internship yet, at least this is an arbitration internship, but I'm going to go for it. So interestingly, when I got to uh, Malaysia, um, I messaged um, David that, oh, that, oh, I'm in Malaysia and I'm doing this internship. And then it was like, oh, um, we just opened uh, an office in Malaysia and I'd like you to meet um, David, I'd like you to meet um, Roderick Noble, who is the director of our Asian business. And so I got to Malaysia, I met with him, we had drinks and tea a few times. And then um, one of those, they just said, would you like to spend some time in our London office? I was like, yeah, you know. So, and um, he just sent an email. They never even asked for, you know, my CV or anything. And um, the, what was then funny to me is the mail that I'd sent like a year ago, they now responded to it saying, you know, you can come and resume, you know, Monday and all of that. So, and, you know, it took me going to Malaysia for me to get that opportunity in London. If I never went to Malaysia, that opportunity would, have, would never have materialized. So, it's, it's like a huge basket of, you know, opportunities. You just have to, you know, you have to try, you know, I, I've, I've developed a very um, tough skin for rejection emails. Oh, just one other mail. So I send any, and even to now, um, I mean, my current role, and I've only been there for, let's say, it's up to a year. Okay, not yet a year. I'm, I'm still sending applications. And sometimes I get a rejection email. I just look, okay, yeah, that, that's another one in the bag. So it's, um, you know, there's just so much to say about it and you know thankfully the speakers have said a lot of it already um i would just encourage everyone you know or anyone that is considering an llm it's it's really i mean it's 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 an investment i mean definitely and and i think it's an investment that would be useful you know in the course of your career i mean 10 years 20 years i mean it's been almost 10 years since my llm and it's still it's still one of the it's still one of the big things in my cv you know um, so, so that's it. I mean, I think we've already run out of time, and um, um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for that. That was a fantastic anecdote on the, 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 the you know, the value of the LLM, the whole long, <laughs> the length of time some things take to pan out, and just the persistence and resilience to keep going, even when you know, if you had never sent that initial email, it would have made a follow-up conversation interesting in the future. So you sent it, and thankfully it worked out. So that's. A fantastic anecdote and what has been an you know an amazing session yes thank you so much everyone thank you so much Naimeka, for your insights uh 
I know that when I was at Bubalaki and I didn't meet you, but I used to hear a lot of things about you and it's really amazing I hope that was. you, <laughs> it's amazing to meet you and hopefully we could sit and have some coffee if you have the time at all. I'm sitting in London, why not? Sure. And thank you so much for all the panelists. Uh, we have spent two hours, seven minutes on this session and you know, if it was still open, we will keep answering questions and questions upon questions. So we're getting, you know, some thank you in the comment section. And we've also answered other questions. If you still have more questions, please feel free to follow Queen Mary CCLS on LinkedIn, even the Nigerian CCLS chapter. And we want to also thank Mr. Davy C. Sander and, uh, for putting this email, uh, for putting this webinar. And for Celia, who has sent reminder emails like, also five times already. She's doing amazing and for Dotun for you know hosting this uh, this session as well. For everyone who participated and stayed till the end, thank you so very much. Uh, thank you and we hope to see you in Queen Mary very soon and in our subsequent events. So this brings us to the end of this session. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.